Welcome back to The Dive. Our guest today has served as a senior macro strategist and worked across leading asset managers. She will deep dive into inflation, interest rates, the inverting yield curve, small cap stocks, the oil market, and commodities that she thinks have the most upside potential near term. She is the chief US equity strategist at BCA Research. Irene Tunkel's joining us today. But before we bring Irene on, do me one quick favor and go ahead and just hit that subscribe button, please. Hey, Irene, welcome back to The Dive. Hi, Cassandra, how are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to do this with us today. Okay, so let's start off with inflation. The consumer price index increased 7.9% in February, marking the fastest annual jump since 1982. What is your outlook on inflation? Um, yeah, really inflation at the core is at the core of all investor concerns and not only investors, but anyone who actually lives in this country and goes to supermarket or to a restaurant. So we all think about inflation these days. We're all you know, inflationistas. Uh, I do think that uh, inflation uh, probably will come down somewhat, held by the arithmetics because the baseline comparisons are much easier. Um, however, um, probably not going to come back to the level that the Fed would consider palatable. Uh, it would still be above two percent, above two and a half percent. So it's very hard to pinpoint the number, but it would be elevated. And I think the challenge for the Fed is to discern which part of inflation coming down is sort of the natural course of events versus the result of the monetary tightening. So I think the Fed's job is extremely hard these days. Um, and yeah. lastly, uh, I am concerned about embedded price uh, wage spiral. Um, real wages in the US are negative, which means that this cuts into consumers buying power. Mm, uh, yes. which suggests that they would come back to the employers and say, look, you have to pay me more. I will come, you know, I will go get another job. And we have 1.7 jobs for every job seeker. Uh, so concern is that inflation expectations um, are elevated, that will become embedded. And uh, this is the vicious circle that has to be broken. Mm -hmm. Now, Fed Chair Jerome Powell noted last week that the Fed could raise rates from the traditional 25 basis points to 50 basis points if necessary. Do you think that 50 basis points will have much of an impact on inflation? I think that everything that Fed does is really about signaling. So remember Mario Draghi's whatever it takes, he have not even done anything and the markets have rallied. So I think that what this will signal to the market is that the COP is back in town. Um, Fiat was a little bit behind the curve or much behind the curve, but now they are, you know, trying to catch up. They consider inflation as one of their key concerns and uh, they are in a case. So I think in a way it's reassuring. In terms of the specific number of the rate hikes, I think the real wages are still negative. Monetary conditions are loose. So uh, de facto, I do not think that this will make a huge difference to the US economy. But I think it's more important that the Fed is saying, guys, we're on this, we will fix this. Mm -hmm. So with such a unique mix of events, such as the yield curve inverting, record high inflation, slowing growth forecasts, and the Russia-Ukraine crisis, some bond investors are increasingly worried that the U.S. is heading for a recession. Do you agree with the recession arguments? Well, I do believe that we are heading into growth slowdown. Uh, I'm not worried about recession yet. And I think it's kind of investors job to always worry about inflation. But at the moment, there are no really signs that we are approaching recession because growth is still strong. Uh, yield curve is moving towards inversion, but it's still a way off. Monetary conditions are still easy. Um, Americans are working. There is still you know, so many job openings for every American. Uh, so I think that in general, economic uh, situation is a classical slowdown. If you think about the classical business cycle slowdown, 
it's uh, slowing growth, uh, high capacity utilization, elevated inflation, Fed is moving towards tightening. And this stage can be quite long lasting, especially considering that we're coming down of very high levels of growth. And at the moment, uh, I don't think that there is anything that would signal that, uh, that recession is imminent. And I agree with Jay Powell. However, there is nothing magical about sort of zero cutoff for growth in uh, recession versus no recession. I think what markets are reacting to is growth disappointment. And this is what we have to watch out for, for the reasons that you mentioned. Uh, the war in Ukraine probably will cut into economic growth. Um, on the margin, uh, monetary tightening will slow growth, and it's not yet reflected in any expectations. So I think that what is concerning is that investors have not baked in the slowdown into the expectations, and then the data comes in, they will be disappointed. And that would be a very adverse event for the markets. Mm -hmm. The U.S. stock market had a rough start to 2022. At its lowest yeah. point, the S&P 500 was down 12.5% year to date. Do you think that this could just be an oversold rally or the beginning of a new bull market? Um, I actually did a report on this a couple of years ago, a couple of uh, weeks ago, because this is something on my mind as well. You know, is it time to invest? Is it time to go back in? And I think that we're getting closer because, you know, technical conditions are oversold, relations have normalized. Um, and, uh, but there are several things that we still need to see for a sustainable rally. So one thing is um, rates have to stabilize. Okay. And rates have not stabilized yet because we have still have negative real rates. So it's not unreasonable to expect that rates would rise at least until real rates will hit zero. So we still have a bit of uh, uh, rising rates ahead of us, which is detrimental for the stock markets. Second thing, energy. Energy prices have stabilized, uh, have reverted at some point, and now they are back, you know, above 100. And this is the main sort of channel of transmission from the stock market, from uh, the war in Ukraine into the stock market. So I want to see stabilization in the energy prices. And I also would like to see this um, adjusted expectations I was talking about, uh, baked in both in economic growth forecasts and stock forecasts you know, earnings growth expectations. I don't want invest to see investors disappointed because that would, would pull the equity market back. So when this duck sort of line, then we will see a sustainable rally. But for now, it's just the bounce. And there is nothing wrong with the bounce. Many people trade on the bounce. But if we talk about longer term sustainable bull market, we are not quite there yet. So given the macro environment, do you think we're looking at a long term bull market for venture and small cap stocks? Well, um, I, I don't think we're quite there yet because the reason that we had the surge in small cap stocks and uh, kind of the um, deluge of IPOs was on the back of huge liquidity injection, very loose monetary policy. And now we're going kind of backwards. We're living through withdrawal of this liquidity. We're living through tight monetary policy. We already started, uh, the Fed has started its rate hiking cycle. Uh, they're signaling that they will move with quantitative tightening. All of this means that liquidity is going to leave uh, the markets, leave capital markets, and this is a huge uh, headwind for smaller, less profitable companies. It's just harder for them to stay profitable and grow when monetary conditions tighten. And also there is less money sort of chasing these opportunities, these lottery tickets. Um, however, they have uh, become very oversold. Uh, if we talk about small cap growth, uh, many of them are down 70, 80, 90% from their peaks. So there will be people who will be buying and will be uh, sort of bottom fishing. Uh, but the way I look at it, I think that again, we can have bounces. We have short-term rallies and there are great opportunities for traders. Uh, I think there are money to be made. But again, if we talk about sustainable performance, uh, we're probably not gonna see that because conditions are just not favorable for this kind of stocks at the moment. Okay. So let's shift back to oil here. Despite severe market volatility, the oil and energy sector has flourished so far. What's your read on the price action in the oil markets? Well, I think that um, uh, a lot of uh, surge in oil is basically down to the war in Ukraine. 
Uh, and uh, to a large degree, it's emotional because uh, US is only importing about three and a half percent of Russian oil. Uh, but still, there is lots of anxiety about the availability of energy. And in general, we have lots of pent up demand for uh, oil. We have shortages just because of different policies um, and this sort of embedded mentality of returning cash to shareholders. US, stock, uh, US uh, oil producers were not producing enough. And also, uh, Saudis are kind of managing their own foreign policy. Uh, so there is lots of anxiety about supply of oil. Um, and I think uh, at this point, with oil above 100, uh, it's very hard, sort of, it's a little bit of a gamble because it's all sort of geopolitics as opposed to risk premium. So we have closed our overweight in energy stocks just because we made quite a bit of money. We closed at 130. And from there, we thought that probability of going down is uh, higher than probability of going up. Having said that, because of shortages of oil, um, US shale producers, US energy companies are at the beginning of the new energy cycle. I wrote a report about that and I called it after seven lean years, almost like biblical. After seven years, uh, lean years of uh, being very um, uh, restricted in their capex and being praised for being, you know, for capex discipline, uh, US oil companies are starting to invest in capex again. Because uh, at this car, at current prices of oil, even at 80, it's very profitable because break even stands somewhere around $45, budgets are around 65. So even if oil comes back from you know over 100 to 85, it's still profitable to drill. And I think the key beneficiaries of this new sort of capex cycle are oil service companies, equipment and services, yeah. companies like Halliburton, because these are the companies that had to tighten their belts because um, upstream companies were not really investing. And now they're investing and they're calling for services. They really need these companies. Um, so we're overweight equipment and services, but we are now equal weight um, uh, uh, production companies. What commodities do you think have the best chance of performing over the near term? Well, the war has wreaked havoc in the commodities market. Again, there's so much anxiety what commodities will be available, which will not be available. And lots of commodities. So in principle, the trade from Russia and Ukraine is very small, but they're producers of some of the metals um, that um, different industries really need. Semiconductor equipment manufacturers, lithium for batteries. Uh, we're talking about palladium. We are talking about nickel. All of, this all of these components are necessary for EV manufacturing for car manufacturing for semiconductors, so they really touch pretty much every single um, uh, manufacturing industry. Uh, and unlike oil, where Saudis can actually turn on spigots any moment, uh, there is really no such excess sort of supply of metals that can be tapped into. It takes a long time to build new mines. It takes you know long time and lots of billions to do expand production. So it seems to me that pretty much every single metal that comes from Russia and Ukraine and um, is now in jeopardy uh, is probably going to perform very strongly going forward despite recent gains just because of the shortages. And also um, agricultural commodities probably will do well as well because of fertilizers that come from Russia and Belarus. And uh, Russia and Ukraine produce 25% of global wheat. Again, it's very hard for someone to step in and pick up the slack because they need fertilizers, but fertilizers are coming from Russia. So it's kind of a bit um, a conundrum. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've heard a few people say that. All right. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. so, <laughs> um, one more thing before we let you go here. Where can our viewers uh, go to learn more about your research? Um, well, BCA Research is one of the probably the oldest independent research houses, so BCA. Um, okay. And uh, I'm sure that if they contact the sales force, they will be able to get sample reports or get a subscription. So I would be very happy if I get more readers. Now I'm a writer, so I would be happy for me, more people to read me. <laughs> yes, definitely. All right, well, BCA Research, we'll get everyone to check it out. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We'll be back again tomorrow. But in the meantime, you could always check out one of our other videos over there.